You do a quick one of these? What's up, man? Good to see you, brother. Welcome back. Guests are showing up. It's, uh, it's going to be a great day here at the Go West Experience. Um, really excited about um, this, this next panel because it was really a, a life-changing moment for me and a lot of the people here at Go West. So um, I'm going to bring out a couple of panelists here. First, I, I want to bring out our uh, uh, director of content here at Go West. Uh, this is Aaron Thiel. She's wearing Go West green today, rocking the Go West green. You can guess it. Uh, our uh, vice president of uh, client engagement, uh, Mr. Richard Yearwood. And so fortunate that he flew all the way in from New York City yesterday to be with us. This is Reverend Mark Thompson. So I just want to uh, tee this situation up. Thank you all for, for being here. So in the um, summer of 2020, August of 2020, my wife and I and our um, then three-month-old puppy decided we were going to um, uh, head down to... Uh, the Redneck Riviera, what we refer to, the uh, uh, 30A down into the Destin, Florida area for uh, a, a few days of va vacation. And uh, uh, it was right at the heart, or right at the height, I would say, or in the middle of the pandemic, a lot of civil unrest, uh, and I had been, you know, uh, ravenous watching all the movies, all the uh, BLM movies that were on Netflix, right? And I watched Selma at least twice. And I was looking at our, uh, charting our course to, to, to drive down from Nashville down to Florida. And I, and I just said to Christine, I was, I was like, you know what? Selma's only about 45 minutes off, our, off the freeway from where we're going. Let's, let's stop down there and... Uh, um, you know, just let, let's see the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Let's go do it, right? It's, it's just the thing everybody wants to do. Let's go take the picture, picture on the bridge. And that's, that's all it was going to be for us. We want to go take the picture. So we, we drive to Selma. We walk across the bridge. We take pictures on the bridge. And we get to the other side of the bridge. And it's a Sunday afternoon. There's the little monuments and things like that. And we see this little store there. And it looks like it's, it's got to be closed. It's not open. It's all you know, bars on it and the whole thing. And we just look in the window and then we hear, and it's like, oh, there's somebody in there. So we, we, we open up, we go into the door, this little gift shop. And the person sitting behind the, the register was, was Drew. And at the time, Drew was in charge of the annual uh, Jubilee. And so he started telling us how this year, how, you know, coming up in 2021, it was going to be this big thing and they're going to take it virtually and they're going to have all these big plans. And, and I just, yeah, I didn't tell him what it is I did for a living. I was just told him how excited I was for him and gave him my business card and said, any way we can help, let us know. And so we're down in Florida and a couple days later I get this email from Drew and it says, I'm so sorry I told you how big our stuff was going to be. I just saw what your company does, and we don't have anything planned like what you guys do. Would you guys be interested in helping? And that little serendipitous moment created what I think was one of the most life-changing events of my life. As we came in, and we got to partner with the city of Selma, and in 2021, we brought the Bridge Crossing Jubilee to a global audience, and that was amazing. So uh, now we are 2023. It's uh, March 10th. This past weekend was, uh, again, the 58th uh, Bridge Crossing Jubilee, and Mark, uh, you, were, you were there, as you are for many, many times. Can you tell us just a little bit, for people that don't know what happens every year, what is the Bridge Crossing Jubilee and why it's so important? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's great to be here. Good to see everyone here. Um, and let me just commend you on what you're doing this weekend. Um, you, uh, you called me and said, I need you in Nashville. And he didn't say why right away, because that's how he is. So I said, okay, I'll just, we'll figure it out. <clears throat> but then as I've learned what this experience um, is all about, because everybody does talk about True North, people don't talk about True West. 
And I was thinking as I was watching you last night, what came to mind, and this is someone who, um, a quote from someone who came to Selma and whose family always regularly comes to Selma because of the importance of Selma in uh, American history and in the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, and that's uh, the RFK family, Robert F. Kennedy's family. Mm -hmm. And he once said that some dream uh, of things they are and that are and say why. He said, I like to dream of things that could be and say why not. And so that kind of, I thought about that as you were talking about going west and right. having that, that experience. Um, it was a serendipitous moment for you to come. And let me just say, go west still, you know, has been very helpful in Selma over, over the past couple of years. But that was the first time we did a full-on virtual experience because of the pandemic. This Selma, the Selma Jubilee, the Selma Bridge Crossing Jubilee, uh, is an event I've been a part of for almost 30 years. Uh, and I serve on the board of the Selma Bridge Crossing Jubilee. It is the only annual commemoration of an historic civil rights event in this country. Um, and it just kind of evolved that way organically. Uh, Hank Sanders, former Alabama Senator Hank Sanders, State Senator Hank Sanders, his wife, uh, Fire Rose Ture, uh, are the founders of the Jubilee. And the idea was that because of the importance of Selma, every year that's an event worthy of commemoration. Uh, for the record, this year, this is 2023, is the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington, uh, the 60th anniversary of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, the four little girls, the 60th anniversary of the Children's Crusade in Birmingham, where the children went to jail, changed the tide of the movement, and then finally, most tragically, the 60th anniversary of the assassination and martyrdom of Medgar Evers. All of these things happened in 1963. Selma was in 1965, two years later, but even as Dr. King said, Selma was one of the most important, if not the most important occurrence because prior to, and sometimes it's difficult for people to acknowledge this or realize it because we take it for granted today. We know there are voting rights issues today still, but the fact of the matter is, before Selma, there was no democracy in America. Um, African Americans did not fully have the right to vote. Women did not fully have the right to vote. Uh, even after Reconstruction, when black men could vote, white women and black women still could not vote. So there was never a period prior to 1965 and Bloody Sunday in Selma when John Lewis and Hosea Williams led a march of about 600 across the bridge in a Black Lives Matter march um, some weeks before a young activist by the name of Jimmy Lee Jackson had been shot and killed by the Alabama state troopers leading a night march for voting rights. The police killed this young man. The plan was to carry his coffin from Selma to George Wallace's capital in Montgomery. The plan to carry his remains was nixed, but the march was going forward. Still the demand for voting rights in memory of Jimmy Lee Jackson. And of course, we, the story, as we all know, March 7th, 1965, they got to the top of the bridge and the state troopers uh, were there and tear gassed and beat those marchers mercilessly. It, viral wasn't a word yet, um, but it went viral because ABC News was uh, showing its Sunday night movie of the week. And the movie that night just so happened to be Trial at Nuremberg. And they broke in with breaking news and everyone across the country saw the images of people being beaten in Selma on that bridge and it became a part of history. Dr. King ultimately went to Selma. He was not there because this was not, so, they were on the sidewalk. This was supposed to be a pretty non-conspicuous event. Uh, he ended up going there and then called the nation to Selma. Um, to march with him from Selma to Montgomery um, over five days. Uh, everyone came to Selma. Uh, at night, um, they would have campsites and they would camp outside, and you can see those markers. Every Hollywood entertainer you can imagine, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, Sammy Davis Jr., provided the entertainment every night along that march. That is the magnitude, Harry Belafonte, that is the magnitude, Ralph Bunch March, um, Jewish rabbis marched, uh, a diverse group of people. Right. And then there were more martyrs. Uh, one was the Reverend uh, James Reed, who was a Unitarian Universalist minister from the Northeast who was assassinated during that period in Selma. 
um, a young woman with a family by the name of Viola Luzo, who was shuttling people from the Montgomery airport to join the march, um, was assassinated um, by the Ku Klux Klan uh, during a carpool uh, that night. Uh, we have now, it has now been revealed that there was one of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI agents in the car with the Klansmen who shot this young woman, took her from her family. The black man she was shuttling in the car that, that night pretended to be dead. We, I think down in Tennessee we call it playing possum. And so when the FBI agent and the Ku Klux Klansmen went to the car to ensure he was dead, he played dead and he survived. He's still alive today and tells that story. But this was the magnitude of Selma. And so that's why every year we do it, and I can't emphasize enough that those of us who enjoy any right to vote today would not have it if not for Selma. Uh, and frankly, as a minister from a theological perspective, Selma was also America's Calvary because that was the greatest sin of America, racism, the lack of voting rights. And so where Christ was on the cross as an individual, these were individuals in a collective sense crucified and on the cross on that bridge and they shed blood for the sins of America. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's, it, I, I, it's so easy to think about Selma as something that happened in 1965. But one of the things that was so impactful for me is uh, because it was in the height of COVID when we were out there sh shooting, we decided to go to uh, Selma four weeks before uh, the actual bridge ca crossing Jubilee broadcast and shoot the marchers going across the bridge and do it in a, in a way that was safe for everybody and they gave us you know the uh you know the, the um the different groups in waves and so they closed the bridge down for us from uh 6 a.m until noon and so i went out there at about 5 30 to meet the police as they were shutting the bridge down and uh the first thing i saw was the the officers coming through with bomb sniffing dogs mm -hmm. right and i'm thinking what? Okay. All right. That's just got real. You know, again, middle-aged white guy uh, from L.A. that now lives in Tennessee going, okay, like, all right. Uh, but then, you know, I hear this heavy whirring of, uh, of blades and this massive drone goes up and it's flying above. And I just went to one of the officers. I said, what, what's going on there? And they said, well, we're checking rooftop to rooftop for snipers because KKK has very active members here in town and they know that you guys are here and they know what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, right. when I, you know, I produced this, this whole um, shoot and so David was like, there, there's a drone and I was like, that's not one of our drones. That's, yeah, and, that's not ours. And it was yeah. just, it, the whole weekend and w I could talk about it for, for days about the experiences that we had and the life-changing events that happened that have changed me to this day. But, that moment particularly, there's a couple moments that I talk about a lot, is that moment it got real of my privilege and my, the, just the craziness of what could actually happen. And I, I knew I was gonna be there. I knew I was going to a place that was vulnerable and had history and these people that went and marched, they had no idea what was happening. And I immediately texted my family and I said, just so you know, I love you all, and mm. I, I'm doing this, and I don't know how I have the opportunity to do this, because right. this, is, this is history in itself, and it was just, uh, right. that moment is a big one for me, too, because yeah. Yeah, I got a white, white girl from small town in Wisconsin right. shooting on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, so. Yeah. It was, you know, there's, you know it's, it's hard to talk about this without, get, without getting super emotional. And I know um, Richard Yearwood, um, it was before you joined our team full time. You were still working as a uh, full time director and producer in television, and you, you gave of yourself to join with us to uh, direct uh, the nine camera shoot that we were doing that day. Um, two things. Tell me what was most impactful for you at the bridge, but then I also want to talk about you know the actual the day of um and when we were doing the actual broadcast well i'll i would say the most impactful thing was walking the bridge alone and walking up the bridge and over 
and then coming back and having that memory, that thought process of, wow, I wouldn't be here if, I, if these people didn't cross. I wouldn't be directing. Like, it's... The whole, ch it changes the trajectory of your life because yes. of what they were able to do for you, you know, 56 years prior. Exactly, and then um, we, we had the people there and they were so loving people. They were loving people. And just interacting with them to cross that bridge, I felt like I was there. I was transported back in that time. And I just saw in their eyes, and I felt their pain, and I felt all what they were feeling. And it was uh, an emotional, emotional time. It was, uh, yeah. Yeah, so for, for me, one of, one of the things is, you know, the first group that, the the uh, Selma gave us were the original foot soldiers. So these are all people that were actually there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so they're all in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and, and some younger, because right. there were people on the bridge that were teenagers, children from high school. Yeah, yeah. And so when they start walking, they start singing. Yes. And I didn't expect that, right? As, as soon as they start walking, they start singing. Well, and that leads me to a point that right. it's like the untold stories of Selma. I mean, right. you just heard Reverend Mark tell you all these things that you probably had no idea even happened. Like everyone knows what happened on Bloody Sunday. Everyone knows that this was right. the big movement that changed the trajectory for black people in America. And uh, it, But you don't hear about the singing. You don't hear about the things that happened. You don't hear about all the supporters along the way. Right. And it was our responsibility and privilege to bring that to an audience that would never be able to hear it if it wasn't in a platform that like right. we got to do so right. yeah it was absolutely incredible so at, at the point where we're walking the bridge and and i'm running alongside and they start singing black and white together black and white together mm. yeah you were done yeah, yeah. you were done. done absolutely done at that point anyway so i i want to i want to transition it and and by the way in the booth we we're, we're going to go along uh, just, just you know, I'm looking at the clock. Well, you know, which you all, which I don't want to say. So, what are you all yeah. describing is the reason I do it, and the reason all of us do it. Uh, Selma is a spiritually transforming experience, right? And um, in the early years when I started to go, first of all, Selma was always very organic. And some things you have to organize and invite, um, but because of the sacredness of it people would flock to Selma on their own. And I'm talking about people from that era. So people have passed away, obviously, but as I said, the Kennedy family, Ethel Kennedy used to come every year and just mingle amongst the crowd. Um, the Johnson children, the, the Lyndon B. Johnson's family um, would come. Uh, one year uh, I was there, and we were just gathering arms, walking across the bridge. And this is before presidents started coming and changing the footprint, because that changes right. everything. Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, one year, we just all got ready to lock arms, and we're walking, and I didn't realize who I locked arms with, literally, folks. And as I'm, I lock, and I look to my left, and on my left arm uh, was Emma Till's mother, and on my right arm was Ethel Kennedy. Uh, and we still didn't have camera phones back then like we have today, so there's no pictures of this. But it, it was just very casual. That is what Selma is, and that's the beauty of the experience, and so what you all described, it, it's, it's, it's that, and I always tell people, come to Selma to be transformed. Yes. So the, the, the thing, and Mark, we talked about this a little, a little bit yesterday in an interview, um, Selma is, is this city that should be so honored, right? right? It, should, it, it should be the focal point of uh, where we change things in democracy and in human rights. Um, but Selma is still a very, very poor town, mm -hmm. very, uh, very much struggling economically. Uh, you know, we, we talked about yesterday about, you know, when the bridge crossing is kind of like their Super Bowl where all these people converge on it, but it doesn't, they really don't have the economic infrastructure in place to actually capitalize on the financial gains as a city that a, a Super Bowl city would because they, they just don't have that. Um, and 58 years later, this place that should be so honored in our U.S. history is still a very, very 
poor community. Talk a, a little bit about that. Well, uh, it is. Um, it, it is very neglected. Like, uh, unlike my hometown where I grew up here in Nashville, is not I me. Mean, Nashville's booming. Uh, and that's a great thing. But there are a lot of cities in the Deep South that are neglected, and Selma is just one of them. Um, in fact, you know, it's never like me to say anything controversial. Um, <laughs> but in fact, um, there's this thing. You talked about photos. A lot of people come to Selma for the photo op. A lot of politicians come. Yep. Some of the same politicians um, who are involved in policies that would restrict or suppress voting rights, um, restrict or suppress the rights of women and their bodily autonomy, come to Selma and take pictures on, the, on that bridge. It's very difficult to tolerate that, but you know it's a free country, people can do that. I'm on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but yet you're doing these other things. Right. And that has a lot to do with the economy as well. Selma is, is economically deprived, not a lot of jobs and opportunity there. And we look at other cities um, where that aren't as famous, that aren't as significant, I'm not saying they don't deserve to be touted and supported, but why not the place that's the cradle of democracy? Yes. And so for the first time, and I commend you, this was the first time that people got to see Selma virtually, and we're getting ready for the 60th. Next year will be 59th, 60th. We want to continue that so the people around the world, right. and then build an atmosphere where there's a level of investment. You know, when President Biden came, and you know, one of the things I said to him, you know, we talk about Build Back Better, uh, the country. We talk about supporting Ukraine, all things which I support, but we got to support this place here. Um, people don't realize this. Um, the first, uh, well, one of the first presidents elected from the Deep South in this era was Jimmy Carter. 11 years after Selma. That could not have happened without Selma. Um, so Selma is just that important. And so I think we're beginning to see a shift in the attitude. We really brought that out this year uh, over and above anything else. And we know we still need the John Lewis Voting Rights Act passed. Voting rights have been gutted. We need to get that uh, restored. But we also said, let's build back self. Yes. We, we, we talked about this uh, yesterday, too, which is really, really interesting that um, it, it, it's, it's kind of a controversial thing, right? The, the name of the bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and he was the Grand Wizard Ku Klux Klan, uh, of the Ku Klux Klan, Klan, right? So his name is still emboldened on that bridge, right? And I know there's people that want to change the name to the Freedom Bridge, or right? But you know, what what are your thoughts on on, on the name? I'll be honest with you, that's a lane um, that I've not gotten in because there's so many different things going on with it, and so many different. Opinions. I haven't settled on one. At one time, it was a conversation about naming it after John Lewis. Uh, I was very close to Congressman Lewis. God bless his soul. He did not want that uh, because he knew who was there with him. There was so he was not the only one there. Right, right. There are many names and faces we'll never know. Uh, but frankly, one of the people who started the Selma movement uh, was Amelia Boynton, right. um, who started this in the late '40s, early '50s. She's recently passed away, lived to be over 100. Uh, the Reverend F. D. Reese, who was on the school board, the first march in Selma before '65 um, was a few years earlier. And it was a teacher strike. All the teachers in the Selma Public Schools went on strike uh, for voting rights. Uh, one of the first people to go to jail and spend the night in Selma by herself, pregnant with a pair of twins, uh, was Lillian Gregory, Dick Gregory's wife, even before Dick Gregory went to jail um, in Selma. So there were a lot of people involved. And it's, it's you know, like we're in a place, you don't want to start uh, naming names lest you leave someone out. That's kind of what naming that bridge is. So I don't, I don't know... Yet I've, that, that's a little complicated for me. I'm leaving that to other people to figure out how they want to deal with that. But, so, and I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, I, I do have to tell th this story. So, so we, 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 we filmed the, the, the bridge crossing four weeks ahead of time. And then the, the actual live broadcast, we broadcast for about a total of 24 hours between Friday, all day Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday, and Sunday afternoon. And the Sunday afternoon leading up to the actual broadcast of the bridge crossing, we were running it like a, a news show. We had right. interviews and people coming in, and, and Mark, you were hosting it. Uh, Richard, you were hosting certain segments. And I remember going to Mark about 10 o'clock in the morning and saying, hey, we're about at 60 minutes light yes. for, the, for the broadcast coming up. <laughs> I think we need to get some extra people. Okay. Yes. Right? And so he's like, yeah, I got, I got you. Right? And so... <laughs> 
He comes back 10 minutes later, and he's like, okay, I, got, I have uh, 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 Jesse Jackson, uh, Martin Luther King III, and uh, I was the senator from uh, Texas, I believe. Yeah, and, and like, you just picked up the phone, and in 10 minutes had these icons of the civil rights movement just, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll join you. And so they did a, an, you know, an hour interview. They all came in during Zoom. But what I was telling you, one of my fair, very favorite moments uh, during the broadcast, and nobody else in the world got to see this, is we're in that control room right there, and we knew that uh, Vice President Harris was going to be doing a live address. And um, uh, Jesse Jackson dialed into his Zoom link an hour early so that he could watch Kamala, Pre Vice President Harris, do her address. And I've got a photo of it, right, because I'm watching Jesse Jackson watch Kamala Harris, right? And it was like, nobody else has seen this. This is so cool, you know? Such a great moment. Yeah. Richard, what was your... You had a moment in studio when you were hosting, right? Yes. Where um, you were you were doing like a lot of the fun stuff, right? You were doing the battle of the bands, and you're right, and you were you were you were the energy as you usually are, right? But you had a moment where you just you broke down mm -hmm. under the weight. Talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. It was. Um I was beside this man. He was he was saying some wonderful words, and it was a, an incredible moment because I realized right then that I am absolutely nothing, nothing, um, absolutely nothing. And I wouldn't agree with that. I would say you're absolutely something. But to the to the magnitude mm -hmm. of this this what we were doing, I was absolutely nothing, and that it, it broke down with you because of that moment. Um, I, I just, I just, I had a problem with what people were putting out. And I, I just broke down. I, I just couldn't believe that I was a part of this. Because I'm from, well, born in England, grew up in Canada, and then I came here. And it was just too emotional for me to compress it. It was... Um, and it was, uh, the, it was the uh, Robert F. Kennedy Foundation, their yes. video, right? Yep. We're showing the, the, the kids that were being thrown around by police and things like that. that yeah. Right. It, uh, it was too much. It was... We don't have that in Canada. We don't have this... We just don't have that... that animosity between black, white, Chinese, Korean, we just don't have it. And to see it phys physically, it's, 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 it's mind-blowing to me that I can't just go up to someone and say, hey, how's it going? And they don't say hi back. It's the weirdest thing for me. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I, was, I just broke down. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. Yeah. But you pulled yourself together and you... As you always do. Aaron, so talk to me uh, just a little bit. Well, when you think about the, the, the whole project, and you know, Aaron, Aaron was in charge of all the content, and this was, again, when I mentioned 24 hours of broadcasting, Aaron was in charge of every piece of content that happened. It was a lot of commercials, it was a lot of content, a lot of segments. You were, you were in charge of all of it, and I remember at the end of it you going, I will do this every year. I will, you know, but tell me what was like, you know, your favorite moment of the entire experience. So the easy answer to that is obviously overseeing the edit of the the virtual bridge crossing. But mm -hmm. the one of the my favorite memories of the whole whole weekend and the whole uh, weekend in Selma and the weekend we had here in the studio was we were running around like crazy people because you know we had two days and it was a skeleton crew and it was the pandemic and we the first shoot we had done in the pandemic and it, it was raining and it was freezing and all this stuff was happening and we're running around all these historic places and um, I walked into Brown Chapel and mm. we it was just you and I and we were walking around and looking to see where we were gonna film 
and you looked at me and you said something and, and I like didn't hear you and I, that's not like me. I'm usually like on it. I'm like always got the next thing and thinking about what's coming after the next thing and all this stuff. And you looked at me and I just was filled with what I call the Holy Spirit of what happened here. Mm. And it just always, I always will remember that feeling. And I always, I brought that into how I produce today because there's just so much untold stories and we had the distinct privilege of telling that story and got to go to all these places and got to be a part of it. So yeah, if I had to tell you all the the late nights and sitting in our, um, we, we had one of our studios and had post-it notes for every single piece of um, content and there was like 400 different pieces that we had to bring together and curate and make sure it flowed because this wasn't just any story we were telling. It was it had to be curated and it, I felt the responsibility to do that and that, that's how I can give back and how I can be a part of this and how I can be involved. And I remember you said to me when we were in Selma and I, I was sharing some of this with you and you said, you are, you will never not be a part of Selma now. Like mm -hmm. You are Selma now. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And amazing. I, I, I carry that with me and it's, it was amazing, and so. I'm, I'm going to tell people you you had a you know a moment of, you you stepped away from Go West, uh, yeah. you know, uh, 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 about a year and a half, uh, about a year yeah. and a half ago or so, and after being with us for about five years, and uh, the gift you gave me when you left was a picture of us on the bridge. Yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. to this day, I haven't done anything better. I, I it is. And you won't. Uh, yeah, and right. I don't you think won't. I can. Yeah. And we nothing as meaningful as, yes. as this. Yeah, and I, I, I got to tell you, um, I know we're, we're running late, but one of my f incredible moments, right? We got the Tuskegee Airmen, right, <laughs> mm -hmm. right, and then uh, did a red tail flyover while we're crossing. That was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. So, Mark, as, as we wrap this thing up, and, and Aaron and, and Richard, thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing this with us. As we wrap this up, what do people need to know? How can they come alongside Selma to try to make some sort of a difference? How do we start, as I mentioned before, how do you eat that elephant? How do you, how do you start chunking away at, at something, doing something, anything, that we can try to, try to make a difference specifically for the city of Selma and what Selma means to this country? Well, actually, you know, just two weeks ago, when we had the Jubilee, did, did we start this conversation? Now we need to figure out how to perhaps build an infrastructure institution to make it real and, and to make it happen so that people can contribute, so that people can volunteer. One thing that did happen during the Jubilee, Selma obviously, and this hasn't made big news, was impacted by a tornado, right. a lot of devastation. So this year, rather than people just coming to march across the bridge, um, we had sort of a hands-on Selma campaign People helped with tornado victims and our slogan, and I think this speaks to you all's experience, uh, was don't just cross the bridge, be a bridge. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, and for us to all be a bridge to one another. Something um, Richard said about, you know, feeling like nothing, you know, those who marched that day, most of their names we won't know. These are ordinary people. And it goes to show how those of us who are ordinary may not have big names, may not have degrees may not be famous can literally change the world um, and I think that's the attitude that we ought to have and I think going forward hopefully more people buy into that I look forward to doing more with you all because uh, I think what you all did and I think now it's even more important having a a virtual experience that can be worldwide right. so that everybody can pour into this place so, you know, we look forward to doing more with you all. And yes, you all are a part of Selma, and I hope all of you watching will be too. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank all of you. Reverend Mark, thank you so much for spending your time here. Absolutely. Um, coming up after the quick break, uh, we're going to hear from an incredible artist here with an incredible heart. Uh, Stephen Cade is going to perform a song for us right after the break. Stick around. <laughs> 